we already have a lot of evidence of what happened to Christians uh, who converted to Islam in these territories. And the most important territories that I discuss in the lecture are the North African ones, which were under the suzerainty of the Ottoman Sultan, but rather autonomous territories. But some of what I say applies equally to the more central Ottoman territories. We know from Inquisition records of people who came back, whether voluntarily or involuntarily, and were questioned in detail, we know quite a lot about the circumstances in which they converted to Islam. In most cases they were not forced. Uh, it was voluntary, but often it was a voluntary process with some natural motivation to improve their circumstances. The great majority were slaves. Converting to Islam in a Muslim society did not make the slave free, but it might well improve his or her chances of eventual freedom. Uh, and it was a way of assimilating more easily to the local society. So there's a lot that we do know already, and there have been some very good books about this by scholars who've worked in the Inquisition archives. But I think until now, the general picture discussing these renegades has still been heavily influenced by the stereotypes that you find in this early modern Western European religious literature and religious sources where it was an enormous leap to move from being a Christian to being a Muslim. Of course, for the priests in the West, it, it was the worst leap you could imagine. You were, it was apostasy. You would lose your soul to the devil if you renounced Christianity. What I want to suggest is that in many cases, it was not a big leap at all, and that some of the characteristics described uh, not just in those Inquisition records, but described by people who visited the North African ports and uh, or people who were slaves there and did not convert and wrote about the ones who had converted. These stereotypes are quite misleading. Uh, many of the characteristics you find are characteristics that connect with aspects of ordinary religious belief and skepticism and irreligion in Western Europe itself. Uh, and the conclusion of my lecture is an attempt to show that there was, in many cases, no big jump to be made from someone who had limited knowledge of Christianity, uh, commonsensical skepticism about some of the stranger doctrinal claims of Christianity, anti-clerical attitudes which were common among peasants. We're talking about illiterate peasants, fishermen, and people like that, to a large extent. And what I'm suggesting is there's a greater continuity between what they were before they moved to North Africa and what they became once they had given up their Christianity and, in some nominal sense, become Muslims. Everything has a history, and modern fears, attitudes, prejudices, all have histories, and some of those histories go back a very long way. So I would say that you can do a kind of archaeology of modern fears and modern prejudices, and if you do it in the case of Western attitudes to Islam, the archaeology has to dig down not just to the period I write about in that book, which is early modern Europe, but before that to the Middle Ages, perhaps even before that to the first Christian writings against Islam, which were written by Byzantine theologians. However, my book is not essentially a study of the origins of contemporary attitudes. Uh, if it contributes a little on the edges of the argument to that, that may be something of interest, but that's not why I wrote the book. The book is about Western political thought, political thought in a very general sense, not abstract political philosophy, but how people thought politically, um, not just theorists, but politicians, priests, theologians, diplomats, uh, the things that travelers thought when they visited the Ottoman Empire and observed a different system of government and society.
and the things that people back in Europe, the ideas that they developed when they read those accounts by diplomats, travellers, missionaries and others. So it's a rather panoramic study of what people thought in the West. And yes, fear is a basic part of it. And the early period I write about, starting with the fall of Constantinople, 1453, is dominated by fear because finally Western Europeans wake up to the enormous military potential of the Ottoman Sultan. But in the 16th century, when West Europeans start traveling in the Ottoman Empire and writing about their travels and what they've seen, a whole new attitude develops, which is actually one of admiration. Here is a system of government and society that is very different, but which seems in many ways more successful and more stable than the one that they have at home. And this causes real surprise. And these arguments then get involved in other arguments which are not essentially about the Ottomans, they're about internal disputes uh, between different elements in Western society. Um, to give just one example, people were struck by religious toleration in the Ottoman Empire. This then becomes a theme in debates between Catholics and Protestants uh, in the French wars of religion and in other, other conflicts, the Thirty Years' War and so on. And so in many different ways, I find that arguments which began as analyses of the Ottoman and Islamic world end up being used in more complicated and sometimes much more interesting ways in internal Western debates. So that's the ultimate subject of the book, and that's why I gave it the title, Useful Enemies.